afternoon and welcome to Faith Base presented by Women of Prominence. Tonight's uh, subject or topic will be a mustard seed of faith. And in the studio we have with us Jimmy Heron and he is the first African American prop master in Hollywood. So we're going to hear about his journey and his story um, into entertainment and just how the favor of God had blessed him in his career. So Jimmy, let's get started Hello. and tell us about your journey. My journey in Hollywood started, I was working at Douglas Aircraft actually and I was laid off. And uh, we get a knock on the door early one morning. So I go, I had the flu, I had been very sick with the flu. And we get a knock on the door and it was my brother-in-law. And so he asked me, he said, Jimmy, I want you to take me to Columbia Studios. And uh, they hire, they're having a minority program out there. They have to hire a certain amount of minorities in the different departments. And I heard about it, so uh, if you could take me out there, I'd appreciate it. I said, man, I'm sick. I got the flu. I don't feel like getting out of my bed. And, uh, you know, but he was very persistent. And he had been in a lot of problems and a lot of trouble, you know, so I said, well, maybe if I get up. And in those days, <clears throat> I was unemployed anyway. And in those days, uh, you had to, you know, go to the unemployment office and say that, oh, I went to this place to look for a job or that place to look for a job. So I said, well, I killed two birds with one stone. I'll just say I went there to look for a job. <laughs> so anyway, we get there, and uh, so I decided I'm just going to lay back here in the car and rest. So he says, man, I want you to come in and help me fill out an application. So I says, oh, really? You don't know how to fill out an application? He says, no. So we go in there, right? <laughs> And uh, we're next to each other, and I says, "Hey, you should." I said, "Don't sign my name now." <laughs> <laughs> and so we fill out the application. So we're waiting on the guy to interview. So we're is, we're about the last. We're the only two in there. So he comes out, sticks his head out the door, and says, "Are you two uh, the last ones here?" And I said, uh, "Yeah." He says, "Well, I'll tell you what. I'll interview both of you guys together." And. Uh, so we go in there, and he said, now look, they're starting a new program in the industry. Uh, it's called a minority program. They're going to put you guys in a pool, he says, and uh, you might get a call. It may be in grips, electric, prop, sound. You know, you don't know where it's going to be, he says. The thing about the industry, there's a lot of layoffs. There's a lot of, you know, uh, if you work, you can make some money, but it's, you know, it's very, you know, it, it, it's not like your, a job job. Right. So, you know, so I wasn't like Richard Pryor say, for nothing, for nothing, leave nothing. Yeah, sure, okay. <laughs> so we fill out the application, but during this time, my first call I got was for sound. N n knowing nothing about sound. Never right. never seen a film company shoot or anything. Well, did you know anything about any of the nothing, different jobs they nothing, were offering? Nothing. <laughs> Now I'm gonna tell you later on when I finish this story how that, that how how that whole thing was <coughs> it was built to fail. Oh, okay, wow. <coughs> so anyway, I get a call from Sound and they send me I, and I said, Man, I can't come in. Uh, I'm sick, I got the flu. All right, so then I get another call for electric. I can't come in, I got the flu. <laughs> so then I get this letter and they tell me that look, if you ref refuse one more call, we're gonna take you out of the list. I'm going to take you out of the pool. So then I get a call for props. It was a place called Spriggs Warehouse in Hollywood. So I take the call and I go to this big warehouse, but I'm still sick. So I tell the guy, man, I got the flu and I'm not feeling bad. And he can look at me. He says, yeah, yeah, I can tell. He says, don't worry about it. You just stay away because we don't want you to, you know, <laughs> No the, germs. Yeah. And keep your germs to yourself. And so anyway, uh, I go home. And uh, then I get another call. About a week later, I get another call. I'm, f I'm feeling better now. And it's the Universal Studios prop department. So I go driving up to the main gate, right? And when I get there, you know, the guy says, you can't park here. I say, I'm reporting to prop department, you know. Well, you, don't, you can't park here. You have to park in the south lot over there. And if you ever go by Universal Studios, they got that big, huge building, not the tower, but this right. big, big, huge building there. That used to be the south lot. That was oh, before wow. that building was there. Okay. So we parked there, and he tells me how to go to a department, you know, how to get to the prop department. So I go down there, and I report to the guy named, at the time, the foremost name, Buzz Henry. 
So Buzz says, look, you guys are going to be going out today, and you're going to be doing, uh, uh, striking some very expensive uh, props. And I'm going to put you guys with Joe, who's an older guy. He's going to be your lead man for today. You just follow his instructions and make sure you take furniture pads out there and wrap this artwork up real good and stuff. And you can finish your paperwork when you come back. So we go to this big mansion in Pasadena. And it was a show called Fame's The Name of the Game. Now, Grant, so this is a game show? No, that was the name of the show. Fame is the name Fame of the game. Fame is the name of the game. Okay. <laughs> so we get out there, and I see all this movement, all these guys pulling cables and shiny boards at the time. I didn't know what they were. Shiny boards and big old lights and, and, and trees and stuff. And I'm saying, I was overwhelmed, you know. I said, gee, what do we have to do? Do we have to help these guys do this? He says, no, nah, that's another department. He's that artwork over there. That's all we have to do. Wow. Is strike that artwork and take it to the man, the artist's house in Pasadena. So we go out there, we get the things, we wrap it up, put it on the truck. We take it to the guy's house. He's not there, but his wife is there. She says, why don't you guys uh, just load the stuff, put it in the garage till he comes back. You can't leave because I want him to inspect in case there's any damage or anything before, before you leave. So we said, okay, so. We unload and put it in the garage. She says, why don't you guys come in while you're waiting? So we go in the house. She says, would you guys like some wine? And one of the guys, a couple of guys, yeah, yeah. Not me. It's my first day on the job, right? <laughs> like no drinking no on job. the job. Wait a minute. So then <laughs> That's she, a trap. <laughs> yeah. So then she turns on some jazz. And I'm thinking to myself, gee, is this the way white folk live? <laughs> you know? They got it good. Yeah. So we, <clears throat> we get back to to the uh, to the uh, prop house, I go in and talk to Buzz, and I says, "By the way, Buzz, how much does this job pay?" And when he told me how much it paid, I'm inside. Woo, <laughs> you know. Now was it more than what you were making yeah. at the aircraft? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and it's funny because you know, uh, I believe in divine intervention. When I used to work at Douglas, I used to look outside. They would open up those big those doors, right? And you'd see all the movement and stuff going and stuff. And, and I worked on the jig. And it's mm -hmm. the same jig every day, so the job always looks the same. Wow. Okay. You're drilling holes or you're drilling, you know, or you're bucking rivets. And it, it never, and it was monotonous. It never changed. And I would look outside and I would see, man, that's, uh, I, I think I would like to do something where I'm, I'm on the move instead right. of just being Some here. Some variety, of yeah. course, yeah. yeah. And so, uh, I worked there for about three or four days and I got laid off. And then I got a call on a Friday to report to Douglas that Monday. And then, then I get a call to report to the studios on Monday. So I had to make a decision <laughs> where I wanted so to you, go. You, so your brother, right? This is who said, come take me to... No, this is my brother-in-law. Your brother-in-law, okay. So your brother-in-law, Timmy, says, I heard of this great opportunity for me, take me to the studio so I can get a job. Yes. And then it turned into not just him getting a job, but you getting a job as well. No, I'm going to finish the story. <laughs> so, so the thing about it is, so I decided I would go Right. to... Uh, studios right so when I get there they put me in the warehouse so I worked in the warehouse or on the back lot crews I mean you got to clean the barns and the western streets and you got to wash wagons and I mean okay. it's, it's the grunt work right right so uh, I decided well I'm gonna sit here and I'm gonna learn uh, these warehouses I'm gonna learn the furniture I'm gonna learn where it's at you know whatever whatever I have to do I'm gonna do my best to learn you know absolutely what it what it is make yourself invaluable exactly so one day I'm sweeping in the warehouse and uh, I see a guy come in and he had on a jacket and he was dressed nice and and there was another guy with him kind of his lead man I didn't know at the time but one was the set decorator and one was the lead man and so the guy says uh, you know I gotta we got to dress up Black Panthers headquarters next week and these are white guys right so the guy says man I don't know nothing about uh, Gary Marino was his name, his lead man. I don't know nothing about Black Panthers and John says, I don't know, I don't know either, you know. So at the time, I was living in, in L.A. and there was a Black Panthers headquarters around the corner from where I was staying. It was a big blue building. 
Okay. On exposition. Where you? Okay, I was gonna say Lamert Park. No, it was in ex I was in on exposition. Exposition. Okay. Yeah, back in the in '69. Oh, okay. And so I went over there and I got a bunch of, li bunch of literature from them. I got some posters <laughs> and flyers and all this stuff, right? So I take it to the to the department and I put it in my locker. So I see the guy one day. And I said, excuse me, sir, I overheard you guys talking about Black Panther's headquarters. And so I got some stuff here you might be interested in looking at. So he looks at the stuff and he says, uh, did you pay for that? I said, yeah, I, I paid it. I said, don't worry about it, it doesn't, you know, it, don't, it wasn't that much. No, no, I'm going to pay you for it. Here, here. He said, where'd you get it from? I said, the Black Panther's headquarters. You, you actually went into a Black Panther's headquarters? I said, yeah. <laughs> So he says, what's your name? So I give him my name, Jimmy Heron. All right, thank you. Well, a couple of days later, I'm in the warehouse just sweeping, you know, that's what I do. Jimmy Heron, uh, come to the prop department, come to the prop office. Jimmy Heron, come to the prop office. So I go into the office and Buzz is sitting there, he says, how do you come to know John McCarthy? And I don't know any, a lot of guys there, you know. <laughs> so I says, John McCarthy? So I described how he looked and how he dressed. Right. He said, yeah. I said, oh, shit, I'm in trouble now. You're like, is it good for oh. me to know him or is it bad for me to yeah. know so, him? Which so, way is this conversation yeah. going? <laughs> <laughs> so I said, well, actually, I uh, brought him some uh, information on, on the Black Panthers. So he just looked at me and said, well, he wants you on his crew tomorrow, so you're going to be working with him. Now, if you go back and look at any of these old Universal movies, right? Uh, from some even some of these old westerns, like the, if it says review or shows, you know, Universal shows, you see set decorator say John McCarthy. That's who that was. John used to be a he was used to be the department head. I mean, he used to be a a, a department head. At, uh, at he was over all, all the prop department in okay. Universal Studio, but I think he chased some. He used to drink too, so he, <laughs> so he chased the cleaning lady around one night, right? And so then she uh, <laughs> she turned him in. They didn't fire him, but they demoted him. So now he was oh, a set decorator. Okay. But th there used to be a board. You'd have to go before a board. Uh, to take an exam to be a set decorator. Mm -hmm. So John would always hire guys that wanted to be decorators to be his lead man because he would have them dress the sets and they would get the experience and he could, you know, train them how to do it. And when they came to the board, he was over the board now. Oh, nice. So they naturally they got the decorator's card. So I went through about three lead men. So finally, he's running out of lead men. So he says, Jimmy, I want you to be my lead man. Because I was pretty valuable to him because I knew the lot. I knew right. the, the furniture. I, I learned all that stuff. That well, I, you said you studied about where everything was exactly. and how things worked so they could call on you at any that time. So I was really important to the lead man. So yeah. I was a good you know, backup to the lead man because if he didn't want to know where certain barrels, boxes, cannons, wagons, all that stuff, you know. Ask I, Jimmy. There you go. <laughs> so... I kind of wanted to, when I was working as a lead man on, on the swing game, we called it, I started watching the guys on the sets, the prop masters and the assistant prop masters. And so I asked, what, what does that guy do? What, what does the prop master do? And they said, well, they're in charge of action props, I mean, food and stuff like that. And I said, I said, boy, I could do that. I think that's what I would like to do. Mm -hmm. So I go and talk to Bob Flynn at the time. He was like head of the department. Well, you got to work uh, 5,000 hours as an assistant, you know, before you become a prop master. I said, oh, that's so great. You know? Well, I'd like to work as an assistant. How do you get a job as an assistant? Well, you got to have experience. Okay. So how do you get the experience? Well, you got to work. Well, how do you work? You got to have experience. So it's <laughs> the old catch 22, you know? Of course. It's a way to keep you out of the job. There you go. And so, I, literally, I used to work with guys they used to come on my crew and uh, they would say, I want to be an assistant prop master. And I, and I said, yeah, I'd like to be one too. They said, why are you doing this? I said, well, I can't get a job. He said, really? He says, well, how, how, how do you get it? I said, go in and talk to Bob Flynn. And I never will forget this one guy. He goes in and talk to Bob. And one day he comes back to me. He was on my crew. He, looks, he couldn't even look me in the eye. He says, uh, 
Jimmy, I'm not I'm not gonna be on the on your crew tomorrow. I'm gonna be working as an assistant prop master on the show. I said, No problem. Wow. Because that's just the way it was. So one day I was working on a show and the uh, prop master's name was Fred Chapman. So, you know, it's uh, we I did, had done a couple of shows that John was the decorator and I was the lead man. Right. Fred was the prop master. So Fred comes up to me and says, "Well, I guess you're going to be getting your you're going to be a be a decorator pretty soon." All all John's other lead men became decorators, and I said, "No, man, I'm not going to be a decorator. I want to do what you do. I want to be a prop man. Why aren't you working as an assistant?" I said, "Nobody give me a job." I said, "Come on, Freddie, you know what the deal is." He looks at me and says, "I got a big show coming up." You're going to be my assistant. It was called Captains and the Kings. It was one of those miniseries when they first started miniseries at Universal Studios. It's a big show, Captains and the Kings. You're going to be my lead. You're going to be my assistant. So I had to go to John and tell him that you know I was going to be leaving him to be working with Freddie. <laughs> but I'm sure the, he wasn't too happy about that. You were his guy. Yeah, but then the the situation was there was a guy named Tracy Farrington. And Tracy, he was a long hair hippie freak in those days. <laughs> but his daddy was a, his daddy was a, like an assistant there. Right. He was the assistant department head. But T Tracy would go to school, so in the summertime, he'd come there and they would give him jobs. But nobody wanted to work with him. So they would always put him on my crew. But he was a very smart kid, you know, so we, right. we got along real good. So anyway, I tell John, I said, Tracy's going to, he'll take over for me, and, uh, you know, so you'll be in good shape. So John said, all right, all right. And so then I told Tracy, I said, Tracy, I can get you a job as a lead man, but you got to do me a favor. You got to get my brother his 30 days. <laughs> so Tracy got my brother his 30 days, because that's, you know, you have to get 30 days before you can join the union. So this is your brother or your brother-in-law? Then now this is my, my brother. My brother, okay, so. I haven't got back to my brother-in-law right. So this is the story now. So years go by and I'm on location, we're in Santa Barbara, and I never will forget because my son was with me. He was about 10 at the time. We're on location and I get a call from my wife and she's hysterical when she's going, oh, he's dead, he's dead. Oh, they killed him, they killed my brother. She had three brothers. So I said, I knew who it was, though. She, yeah, something told me. I said, well, which one? She said, Timmy. They killed him. He got into an argument over some guys playing dominoes. They got into a fight and got shot him. Oh, my gosh. And the sad thing about it is he never got a call. Oh. Well, you, you were talking about divine intervention. So it's like when, we, when we're talking about um, our journey Yes. Um, in our faith and just having a mustard seed of faith, right? Because you weren't even interested in no, the job at no, all. You sick. were really going to, <laughs> to give him. Jimmy or uh, Timmy a ride and help him fill out his application because exactly. he wasn't sure what to do. But God used him to put you in position to to raise you up in, in the position, which is awesome because you took an opportunity that you weren't even looking for and you made it something great um, because of your dedication and your tenacity to work because you have a good work ethic you know so you could have been in that position only did what you were told mm -hmm. and never got an opportunity to elevate mm -hmm. but because you saw hmm how can I make myself invaluable because that was your thought process you were recognized and even though it wasn't in the division that you wanted to be in, you you saw something else greater, more creative, more yes. you know, empowering for you as an individual, and you were like, I'm going to get there because you didn't even give up on that. You you continued on the journey that you were doing the set design, and you said, I'm going to keep looking over there at those props. You're right. And all it did was take one person, really, to ask you a question about where your career was going for you to say, well, no, that's really not the direction I want to go in. I want to go in the direction where you are and for him to value you and respect you enough to give you an opportunity. And then you took that opportunity and then you helped family members. So I love that. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like, talk about that minority program. It was a program built to fail. 
How so? Well, they had to hire minorities. So the minorities that they hired were parking lot attendants, the shoe shine guys, mm -hmm. the custodians. Now all jobs are good. I'm not knocking what right. they did. But these guys are already in their forties. Okay. You know. And they weren't very ambitious. I mean if you shine and shoes one day now and you're making, you know, thirty dollars the next day when you know, it's like it was a big transition, you know right. what I'm saying? So they were set. But at one time when I when I started working there, I was actually the youngest person in the whole prop department. Wow. And now because then back in those days there was a lot of nepotism. Right. It still is. Right. But it was an old old boy network. I'm talking really an old boy network because mostly all the guys, all the decorators, old guys, and the, and the prop masters, were old guys. Mm -hmm. And so it was hard for young people to to, to even to, get to into the business unless you were related to someone. And the way they did things is just the way I did it. You hire my kid, I hire your kid. Right. <laughs> They're not working with me, but they got a job working. Right. So that's the way they 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 kind of did it. Well, it sounds like the entertainment business hasn't changed it then, hasn't changed because it's a all lot. about who you know and who can get you into the door. I mean, I do think that you have to have <laughs> skills because obviously you you had enough wherewithal and enough sense about you to to uh, to make a place to become invaluable, and I think that's the key too. Even currently is when you get an opportunity to work a job or get be next to a job that you would want or go down a career path that interests you put your best foot forward and look look around and and figure out how can I add value to the situation so that I can become invaluable and I can keep a keep the job yeah. and grow and yeah. develop and get to where I'm trying to, to go you know and yeah. I think some people miss think they miss that or like you said they don't have ambition but I just in your story I just see a uh, favor woven throughout the whole thing um, because I think I saw a clip about you um, that was done about you being a prop master and you even got your son involved right not only did I get my son involved I had a niece she passed away in November Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. She, uh, I got her in in hair. Her name, her name was Felicia Heron. She worked quite a bit. She had, she had a pretty good resume too. Wow. I uh, got a nephew in. I uh, got him in electric. But he he uh, he'd rather go to school. He he's 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 actually now he's the head coach of the girls basketball team at West LA Junior College. Oh, okay. I got him in as an electrician. My son's still in the business. Oh, really? Yeah, he's a prop master. Okay. He's so he father he followed in his father's footsteps. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, I mean, you you I'm even thinking of just how you generated jobs even. You know, you got into the position and when you saw openings, you said, "Okay, I have a I have a person for the job," which gave your family an opportunity to learn a new trade and get good at it. At one time, I I had the largest black family in the industry. Wow. My wife's a production accountant. My son's a prop master. My nephew was an electrician. I had another nephew I got in to do props. I had a, a godson that I brought in. He's a, a lead man now. You know, so I love it. So, and then not only just my family, there were several people that, that I that I right. that I helped. You well know, you turned it into the family business. Like entertainment became the family business for you and you were able to um, I just love that you passed on that blessing of what of what you knew. Because you you didn't have experience. You gained no. experience because of the program. And even though the program wasn't a total success success, it was a success for you. Like you knew how to take the opportunity and make the best of it. And because you did, you granted that same blessing to other people in your yeah. family. You know, it, it's like there's a lot of guys doing it now and, and the people get in the industry now a lot easier than, I got in it because of the program. Right. But it, it was very difficult in those days to, to even get jobs. Oh, well, absolutely. And then not only that, it's like they didn't want you there. 
I right. didn't tell you about the park when I first started there. I had to walk through picket lines. Did you? They were disgruntled white guys because they didn't like the minority. Oh, you program. got hired over them. There you go. Right. So they set up picket lines at Universal Studios in 1969. Wow. And we had to go through picket lines to go through work. So then when you get there, they set up a lot of traps. I, I can tell you little stories. These are true stories. Right. There was a there was a used to be a bar right across the street called the Nets, mm -hmm. nice bar and grill. So they would go there for lunch sometimes. <clears throat> so I knew some guys used to hang around with some of the guys, and they would in invite you to go to lunch with them. I, I wouldn't go, but I knew some guys who went to lunch with them. They go over there and they drink beer and stuff. Right. <laughs> and then you. job regardless of their skin tone and as long as they come in here and do what they say they're going to do then they'll they'll stay employed and you kind of created that avenue for them to say okay if I can get another Jimmy and another Jimmy and another Jimmy then we'll we'll do just fine with this production yeah it's like there were also other other black guys I kind of mentored to too you know Right. They worked as my assistants throughout right. the years. Because when I first was telling people I wanted to be a prop master, they would say, man, I wouldn't do that if I was you. I would stay right here in the warehouse and <laughs> you, know, you have a job. <coughs> right. You know. Well, I love that. I love that on today's um, episode of Faith Base, we're talking about a mustard seed of faith and how Jimmy um, took the opportunity to go into a career he knew nothing about. Um, he took advantage of a program that was available to him. He made himself invaluable. He made a mark, and he also created a legacy so that he could give back and pay it for it in his family. Um, so hopefully you all have been inspired this evening of how you can make something out of a little bit of nothing. Thank you for joining us.